Mask Mapped, episode 110. I am Dr. Ryan Gray, the mapped person who uh, <laughs> who talks first on these before I introduce all of my mapped friends. Uh, starting in order that we have here on the screen, Varinia Granum. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. How's it going? It's going. I'm excited to have you here and uh, to share your wisdom with lots of years of experience as the former assistant dean in pre-health and STEM advising at Hofstra University. That's Thank cool. you for being here and sharing that wisdom with us. Glad to um, be here. We have our newest member who uh, we had a false start last week. <laughs> Hopefully tech is working this week. Courtney Lewis, former director of admissions at Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine. Thanks for joining Thanks. Let's uh, try this again. I'm excited to have this up and functioning. Yes, it, it will work this week. I know it will. I have yeah. faith. I have faith. Uh, well, I'm excited. Um, Courtney, you, you have a wealth of knowledge about medical school admissions in general, and then obviously a, a, a unique subset of knowledge with the osteopathic world. So uh, I'm excited to start sharing some more of that very specific behind the scenes knowledge that you have um, with, with all the students here. Another former director of admissions, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Dr. Scott Wright, former director of admissions at UT Southwestern and retired executive director at TMDSAS. I, I miss the Tim Doss days that uh, Ra Rachel used to have uh, using it as an, uh, an acronym instead of an initial. We learn and yeah. we get better. Yeah, um, yeah, I know, but I missed it. Like I long for those Tim dolls. We a we actually toyed around with changing the name of TMDSAS to something else more that would flow off the tongue a little bit better than that. Yeah. But anyway, we didn't. So whatever. We didn't. Yeah, one day maybe. One day. <laughs> right. Right. Well, we'll hold a contest, and then yeah, it, whoever go. whoever wins the contest gets uh, free TMDSAS services. Oh yeah, there you go. I love it. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> last, last but not least, Rachel Grubbs, co-founder of Maps, with lots and lots of years of experience as well in the MCAT and pre-med world. Hello, my friend. Hello, hello. Excited to be here. Excited. It's raining in Ohio. It I is. Oh, some rain. I'm Wonderful. so jealous. Oh. <laughs> Um, so for all of you joining us live on, on Instagram, on, uh, YouTube and Facebook, um, welcome. Thanks for joining. Our goal here is to answer as many questions as possible in the next hour. So ask them, we are here to answer them. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll help. We'll give you our, our honest opinion on things. So that's our goal. Um, let's rock and roll. Amy's got a good question here. Amy, I got my MCAT back and improved from a previous take of 494 to 499, 124 to 126 in the sciences, but cars remain the same at 122. Uh, the rest of, the, rest of the app, I believe is good. What should I do? Apply question mark. So Amy doesn't have her application in potentially, maybe, or maybe she does, but is, is waiting on secondaries. Courtney, let's start with you here. Um, let, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk kind of general what pre-meds would say is, oh, 499, you should apply to DO schools. That, that is the like knee-jerk recommendation for some reasons. Like you have bad stats, apply to a DO school. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> students say that but let's let's talk from an, a director of admissions standpoint um for you you see an improvement 499 to, to 494 to 499 that is above cutoffs for some schools if this lands on your desk how are you looking at this retake and and an application as a whole with a, a 499 Obviously, it's good to have an improvement, right? So you definitely want to see a jump in the numbers and not a decrease. Um, if we're looking at the rest of the application, I think that that would be helpful um, because that's going to come into play as we're trying to gauge what type of student we're getting based on the information that Amy is providing in her application. So I wouldn't say it's anything that would rule out. Again, it's not a drop. It is a jump in the number. 
Um, but you're going to want to make sure that you're very thorough in your application. Give us as much information as what the prompts are asking for and as much information that will kind of help us piece together what type of student that you are. Um, if this wasn't the number that you were hoping to get for your MCAT, there's other things that we definitely look at as we are reviewing an application. Yeah. It's not a great score. Uh, it may work for some scores. Again, it's, it's one piece of the pie that I, I think there's too much focus on apply, not apply with just one factor. But mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, it's time and money. <laughs> Do you have the time? Do you have the money to apply? Unfortunately, it comes down to the, those things. Awesome. Andre asks, would doing summer research at the medical school of a university I don't attend help my odds of getting admitted? Could it hurt my odds at other schools if they think I'm very interested in that one? Scott, we often talk about playing the game, <laughs> playing mm -hmm. the game mm -hmm. of if I do this, then this school's going to think this. And what if they think about this? And, 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 and just trying to plot out one's life based on how medical school admissions are going to be thinking of things. Our general advice is do what you want to do. <laughs> let, <laughs> let things work out. What, what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I agree with that, Ryan. I, I think that, uh, Andre, I think you're overthinking it, number one. And this is very common amongst uh, pre-med students and applicants to overthink every little detail of everything. But I do think that you're, you're giving, you know, the, the, in my experience, the medical school admissions committees, the admissions officers, they're not going to presume any, anything necessarily that because you did research at one school that you're super interested in that school and that you won't attend their school because of that. They're not going to think that they're going to look at the research experience and say, this is a great experience. It was at a medical school. Uh, you probably learned a lot. So, you know, et cetera. So now uh, to the question, is it going to help your odds of getting admitted? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I think that uh, research, having research experience, for yourself is a great, you know, a, a great thing. And, and I certainly encourage that if you're, if you're interested in research. Uh, but I don't think you need to do it because you think it's going to get you uh, some, some uh, improve your odds or something that do it for other reasons other than uh, uh, improving your odds that that's not how it works. Yeah. No. Too many games, too many games. Yep. Yep. Live your life. Enjoy your yes. life. Tell yes. your story. Yeah. It'll work out. The color of my camera just changed. I don't yeah, know why. Did. You got tan all of a sudden. <laughs> I got, I got tan. Yeah. It's a, the white balance on my camera changed. It was weird. Yeah. Um, Cam one Cass 11 is in-person non-clinical volunteering preferred more than online non-clinical volunteering. Uh, I'm currently doing online tutoring and last I've done in-person volunteering was last year. Bernie, a very common kind of in-person virtual uh, dilemmas these days with COVID um, making an impact on the world. Does it matter if it's in-person or volunteer? No, I, I, this is another one of those questions where students are kind of overthinking things. I think that it's a valid concern, but it's not, it's really volunteering is volunteering, whether you're doing it online, whether you're doing it in person, uh, at the end of the day, are you helping someone? That's what matters. So, uh, they don't have a preference one over the other, whatever you can do at this point, um, given the circumstances that, you know, there's not a lot of in-person activities available. Uh, but if you can make an impact virtually, it's just as valuable. So go for it. Go for it. Go for it. I love it. Okay. Matt Mac. Hello. Welcome back, Matt Mac. Um, when it comes to submitting secondaries, when do they begin to be considered late? Assuming you are submitting within the recommended two weeks, September slash October. Uh, Courtney, let's let's bring you up again. Uh, we talk often about this two-week rule, this rule of thumb for secondaries. At uh, Burrell, again, the, the medical school that you recently came from, did did you set a deadline for secondaries? Some schools do. Did, did you all set a, a deadline for secondaries? We did not. So as long as it was within the, the range of deadlines that we gave for the cycle, as long as it was submitted by those dates, it was fine. Obviously, you run the risk. The later you submit something, 
um, the less interview dates are potentially going to be available. Um, offers are usually already being extended if you're doing rolling admissions and things like that. So it does delay the whole process. It's not just getting in your secondary. You could have, you know, a queue of up to 100 other applicants that are also seeking to be reviewed, you know, a timeline in between decision and invite for interview, and then when an interview date is available, and then when an offer can go out after. So it really does push things back, even if there isn't um, a set timeline of when you have to turn it in. Um, yeah. So. Rolling admissions. I, I don't think students pay enough attention to rolling admissions and, and how that can potentially affect things. So that's, that's important. Um, we often talk about there's always a potential that medical schools, even if they don't have a deadline, can track when they send out a secondary and when it is received and, and use that as a potential measure of, well, does this student really want to come to us or were they doing all the other secondaries before ours? Um, how much do you think is, is that actually used in practice? We can definitely see that information. Um, I can't speak for other directors. Um, you know, when it's, I would think that it would come into play maybe as you get later and later in the cycle. Um, but, you know, we would send reminders to people who hadn't resubmitted it that we had invited, just remembering them that it's still available. Um, we understand that applicants, especially, you know, ones with competitive scores and good applications that have really, you know, gotten experience and everything else, they're probably going to have multiple offers or options and things like that. And so um, on both sides. So yeah. it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. We can see it though, for sure. Um, some schools may weigh that more heavily. Um, it's another data point, but I don't know how often it actually comes into play as, as a decision-making factor. Yeah. Yep. It's just another data point. <laughs> it's like, if you can avoid <laughs> having a bad data point, let's avoid it. <clears throat> Love it. Cameron asks, tips on developing a good relationship with a professor in a large class to later get a letter of recommendation. Verinia, as uh, the former university uh, mm -hmm. pre-health advisor, did you have any tips for students to build those relationships for potential mm -hmm. letters of recommendations? Yeah, my, my first tip was always don't just want the letter, want to genuinely get to know the professor. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> yes. Okay, don't don't come in with an angle of I just want a letter at the end. It really yeah. should be because you're interested mm -hmm. in what they're doing. Um, connect with them early on. Come to them for office hours. If you're struggling with something in the class, that's a great opportunity to go and talk to them. Um, but even if you're not, if you just want to, if you know, do some research in the department, see what their interests are and what they're researching. Uh, and if that's something you're genuinely interested in, of course, show interest in that. Um, but but be very um, open and honest and, and not, you know, immediately saying, I'm going to get to know you because I want a letter. More so just because I really want to know what you're doing and I'm interested in what you're doing. So that's the best piece of advice I'd, I would give a student. Yeah. Build, building that relationship with the sole purpose of a letter yeah. of recommendation is that's called manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> Let's build some relationships. It's really here. grimy. Yeah. Yes. Woo. Uh, I got my second quartile score for my Casper exam. How badly will this affect me in northeastern schools like Temple, Drexel or the Sunnis? Rachel Wu has a very specific like northwestern or northeastern <laughs> schools. Um, let's just talk in general. Casper scores, how much should students be thinking about like, uh oh, I got first quartile, I got second quartile, my application's over and done with? Yeah, well, first I'll say you got that score. You can't retake the Casper in the same year. So there's nothing you can do about it. So, I mean, second quartile's fine, right? But even if it were the bottom quartile, like it's done. So I would, I would practice a little grace and comfort with that which you cannot control. But also, the Casper is still relatively new. And anytime a student says, how is this going to affect me with insert block here, our answer is going to be, we don't know, and it's going to vary school to school, committee to committee, year to year, right? Because admissions committees do not act as one block, one identity. Um, but the Casper is still relatively new. 
Um, some schools have said they're using it in their admissions process. Some other schools have said they're actually just collecting it and not really using it as a factor for admissions, but going to later as they're making acceptances and watching students progress through the, the med school experience, see how much correlation there is between uh, the success that they have in school and the CASPER result. So, um, you know, there's a lot of variation there. If you want to know specifically about a specific school, the best you can do is go look on their website and see if they have any, any policies or specific information about what they do with the CASPER. But um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat it either way because it's, it's done now. Mm -hmm. yep. It is done. It is done. Yeah, and, and Altus, they, they obviously can't set directives for medical schools, but their general recommendation to medical schools is do not use Casper as a cutoff score um as, as a filter so whether schools do that or not it, obviously they can't control that but that's their recommendation is it shouldn't be used as that sort of data point yep. the science samurai love it for the activity <laughs> section in tmdsas what do you input for location if it's an online activity say virtual shadowing uh, Scott, any recommendations here as the former executive director, retired executive director at TMDSAS? Should they just put like yeah, home? Yeah. 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 I would just say, you know, if it's, if, if it's virtual shadowing, you know, just, you, you could give the, the uh, general location, the city or, or something like that. Th that's not going to be a big factor that that's going to affect anything. So I, I, I don't think you need to, you know, obsess about that too much. Just uh, put what, what would make sense to you. And it, that should be fine for the for the schools. They're not even going to notice that probably. Yeah. It, is that entry box, is that specifically tied to data points like cities in this country or in the world? Or could they literally put online or virtual? I don't I don't recall if, okay. if that if that is a, a field that is a free field that you just put input something or if you choose. I, my sense is my, my recollection is it's a it's a a free entry field that you just put in whatever. Okay. Yeah. 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 Do what, do what makes the most sense. Right. That's right. Easy peasy. Easy. Dristin for secondaries that ask about a time I've seen bias. Would it be too risky to talk about a time I myself was biased and what I learned from it? Interesting. Mm. So Courtney, there are some secondaries that will ask like, give me a time where you uh, had some bias or you um, recognized bias or saw bias in other people. If it's not specifically asking, give me a time where you exhibited bias, do you think a student should stay away from that? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> um... <laughs> like it's like you you know there's the fifth amendment for a reason you don't want to uh, incriminate yourself <laughs> yeah it's you know there's there's not many kind of if it's not asking specifically i don't know if i would offer that that information um you're trying to pose yourself while not skewing things but in the best light for yourself right mm -hmm. and so um if there's other things that you've seen I'm, I'm sure that there are more situations unfortunately um where some things come up i don't know if i would lead off with with talking about yourself however if it does ask you specifically about yourself that question is posed because we want you to answer um, mm -hmm. that certain way and we understand that the content um, maybe, you know, posing somebody not in the best light. And, and that's specifically why we're asking. We want to see if somebody is self-aware, if they're, if they have learned from it and things like that. But in this specific circumstance, if it's not asking you to do that, I'm, I'm not sure if I would lead off with that, um, while you're trying to put yourself in, in the best frame of light, if you have other things that you can point to. Yeah. The tough one. Yeah. And I, I think it's very easy to go answer the question. If the question specifically is a time that you've seen bias, well, technically, if you're doing the biasing, is that seeing bias or 
not right and it, it's if you stick to like what is the specific question then then maybe that's as easy of like that's not answering the question interesting McKenna, I addressed academic discrepancies in my TMD SAS optional essays, but a lot of Texas schools ask for the same in secondaries. How do I tackle it without being repetitive? <sighs> Verinia, that optional essay can get people. Uh, I, I saw a recent optional essay for TMD SAS where the, the student basically put their two most meaningful uh AMCAS activity descriptions in the TMD SAS essay. And I'm like, well, I don't think that's what this is for. Um, academic discrepancies, potentially an option there. It's kind of like a, anything else you want to tell us. It, it almost gets to how much should students be screening secondary questions to make sure that they're not wasting opportunities yep. on secondaries because they address something in a, a primary. That's getting a little a little ahead of ourselves there. How does McKenna address, like, d does she just put, I already talked about this, or does she just answer <laughs> it? And like, Yeah, no, I think you still have to just answer it, McKenna. You have to address it, uh, specifically if, if you know, the optional essays, um, because it's so open-ended, um, and that's if that's something that you are concerned about in your application, then, then just reword it, re rephrase it. Um, it is going to it is going to get a little bit repetitive. Um, another um, opportunity to use the optional essay is uh, um, to talk about um, maybe an experience or a hobby that you have um, that you haven't been able to address anywhere else. Um, and some some really fun stuff can come out of that. And it just gives you insight into who you are as a candidate. Um, but so that's another option if you don't want to just focus on the academic discrepancies. Um, but I don't I don't think that it's an issue for it to be repetitive. Uh, if that's what you want to talk about, maybe just rephrase a few things. Um, it, you know, it is it is just it is what it is. Tis what it is. Mm -hmm. Got another question? Yeah. Lying through questions today. Fia, I am retaking my MCAT on August 26th due to an initial lower score than I wanted. Should I submit my secondaries before my new MCAT score and be complete or wait until September when my new score comes back? Rachel, this is kind of a, a continuation of that same secondary question we were just talking about of this person could potentially sit on their secondaries and wait for the MCAT score. That may be the best financial decision. Potentially right. that new MCAT score comes back poor again and they haven't wasted the money submitting secondaries. But on the other hand, is it sending a signal to medical schools that you're not interested because you're just sitting on secondaries? What should FIA do here? Yeah, I, I don't think there are easy answers because it might depend on the resources you have available by which I really mean time and money, right? So if you are trying to proceed from the most optimistic point of view and also have the time and money, then I would say you should be working on your secondaries concurrent with your MCAT prep. You should be turning those in as soon as you can so that, so that one, you know, like we said, it's just a data point, but the data point shows that you got secondaries turned around relatively quickly. Um, and, um, and also, so you're not trying to save them to work on them after the MCAT, because that's still a month away, right? Because then they're not going to get in until mid-September. So I, I would say just get them in, you know, as quickly as you can while still doing justice to them. You can use it as a break from your MCAT prep, right? So maybe you're not stopping working, but at least you're switching between the two different kinds of work for different brain activity. Um, and then that way, when the score comes in, everything's ready to go. So that's, that's what I would advise as the most optimistic standpoint, both in terms of your outlook, but also assuming you have the time and money to do it. Um, if you're really worried that this score is going to make or break your application and that you might get a score back that makes you realize this isn't my year, then yeah, you, you could play the game and wait. And it would save you the secondary fee money. Um, but just means that you know if you wait until September 26th or whatever to even start writing secondaries like that just that makes me nervous for you for um for how how late in the application you are 
Yeah. Doesn't mean you have no chance, but it doesn't help your chances. Yeah. It's, it's a, a rock in a hard place with yeah. uh, poor scores coming back later, needing to take the MCAT later. The, the biggest question that I always want to make sure students are aware of is that let's say uh, Fia got her score back kind of last week, two weeks ago, whatever it is. And it's like, okay, I need to retake the MCAT again because I've already applied and I need to retake the MCAT because my first score isn't good enough. Well, let's, let's pause for one second. Let's take a breath. Uh, right. Let's do a little yoga for pre-meds with Rachel. <laughs> let's, let's <laughs> figure out, am I even going to be ready in August to retake right. the MCAT or am I just knee jerk reflexing re reflexively saying I have to take the MCAT I may not be ready, but oh, well, I have to take it again. And that is a poor mistake as well. So it's it's such a stressful time for students. And that's why we, we recommend specific timelines so that we're kind of uh, stretching out the stress. So it's all not one, in one big ball of, of disaster. Um, but I, that's the first question is make sure if you're going to retake it, are you really ready uh, to yeah. retake it? Yeah, great point. And, and um, you know, literally in terms of percentage of life, right? If you are, if you, I don't know how old you are, but for example, if you're 22, one year seems like a long time, right? It's mm -hmm. a bigger percentage of your life. I'm 44, so one year for me doesn't seem as long. Um, <laughs> but, you know, 30 years from now, you're not going to look back and be like, man, I really wish I'd started med school in 2023, not 2024. Like, it's not going to matter. Yeah. Um and people are, I know, because I've seen them in the pre-med hangout, people are already forming study groups for the January MCAT. So there's nothing wrong with taking the MCAT in August, being delighted with your score, and still choosing to apply next May. Because to Ryan's point, we think the ideal timeline, so anyone who's thinking about applying next year, we think ideally you're taking the MCAT by January or March as your backup, because you need a lot of space in the winter and spring to be working on all of the application. So personal statement, um, e e extracurriculars. We often talk about getting your primary app in and then starting secondaries, but actually Texas applicants kind of need to do them concurrently. Um, and also if you're applying later in the summer, you end up needing to do them concurrently. So it's it's a lot of work and there's, there's no shame in taking an extra year to be sure you're doing it just right. Agreed. Yep. Peter, I have done and I'm still doing a couple of years of shadowing and community service. I want to apply in 2023, but I won't be able to get a committee letter from the program. Does it matter? So one of my big personal missions in this world is to get committee letters uh, done with, over with, uh, stop using them. There was actually a good conversation at the National Association of Advisors of Health Professions meeting about the usefulness of committee letters and if if advisors should be doing them. Courtney, uh, with with Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine, again, the, the osteopathic school that you recently were the director of admissions at, how much did you love committee letters because it potentially made things standardized for that group of students that came with them? And and would you hold it against students coming from schools where you knew they had a committee letter and they didn't get one? Another interesting question. Um, so full transparency, I would say people do know which schools write committee letters. And if you can't get one or it's um, dated or things like that, I wouldn't say it's a favorable thing. Um, is it going to be a rule out decision? Not necessarily. Um, there is, you know, it's nice to have somewhat of standardization and, and things like that and kind of know a program's ranking system. Um, for my school specifically, we didn't use it as, as a tool, like I said, to rule out anybody. Um, but but knowing other schools and processes and things and, and hearing discussion in selection committees and admissions committees, um, a lot of faculty know each other. <laughs> they kind of make the rounds and they know other universities and things like that. And so usually they're aware of if there's a committee or not. 
So it's, you know, again, it's going to depend on the school's process, on a little bit of subjectivity of who's reviewing and, and their view on it. But um, I wouldn't say it rules you out completely, but it's, it's something that, that could potentially be factored in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where, uh, your, your stance, I think is very similar to a lot of medical schools where they, they know who's writing committee letters. They're going to question what's going on. It, it's not a complete rule out for the most part, but it, it may, uh, pop up some questions that, um, that, that may happen. And I just like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> we, can, yeah. we can have a whole, a whole hour just on committee yeah. letters yep. and yeah. uh, my thoughts on that. I think usually it comes into play. Um, if there's other questionable content or concerns in that same application, because then you start kind of getting a picture where there's multiple things that you're worried about and you're wondering if they're all related as you're trying to paint this picture of the applicant with the information that's provided. So I would say it, it may weigh a little bit more in those type of circumstances when you've yeah. already had a bit of concern. If that's the only thing that you're worried about, it probably won't hold that much weight. I know some committees, they have a cutoff deadline and if you miss that deadline and things then you won't get one and, and that's okay. We, yeah. we don't need it, but um, I, I think it would weigh heavier if there were other concerns. Yeah. And, and that's a good point, right? It's, it's, uh, I, I talk about it all the time, right? One single grade, isn't going to ruin an application. One single data point, usually, unless you're <laughs> have some felony, uh, bad, bad stuff on your record. One single data point isn't going to ruin an application. But these little things adding up are like, what's this? What's this? What's this? Oh, and they don't have that. Ooh, that's that. I can now potentially paint a picture because I've seen this before. I've 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 read this book before. Uh, I potentially know who this student is as a person, why they don't have a committee letter, why this is showing up here. And so it's it's usually not just that one thing. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like if I'm, I, you know, students are always sort of looking to it give us very specific examples. It sounds like GPA cutoff, timeline cutoff, not a concern, doesn't know how to play nice with the adults and people of influence in their world is a concern, right? Yeah. And, and I, I'm mentioning that explicitly because we hear a fair amount of students trash talk their advisors. Now that's, I think, because the students who love their advisors maybe aren't as vocal about it, but I think often, you know, when students say things to me like, well, my advisor at my school isn't much help, I always immediately go to, well, is it that that person needs more training and support? Or is it that that person has 600 students and they're just one human being and you're expecting more than they can realistically give to you when you're a freshman? Um, you know, I, and I think it's important for students to consider what it's like in the same way, Verenia, you were talking about building a relationship with a professor Mm -hmm. building a relationship with your school mm -hmm. advisor, getting to know that person, understanding how you can take advantage of what they have to offer, but also what stuff they've, you know, many of them have built great websites or have great handbooks. Like, did you read all that through before you went to pick their brain? Or did you ask them to tell you things you could have yeah. Googled? <laughs> um, and again, I'm also anti-committee letter for the record. I'm just saying, if there's one at your school and you're not being politic about it, shame on you. Natalie, I'm a research assistant in gambling addiction and the marginalized experience lab. That's interesting. Does that count as research experience? Someone told me that the research should be science related. Should I change? Research is research. Uh, I, I talk about it all the time. I had a student I worked with several years ago who uh, was a geologist and her research was in rocks. And uh, yeah, she's, uh, she might actually be an intern now. Uh, it's been a while. So research is research. Uh, inquisitiveness has no bounds. So mm -hmm. you're fine. And, and I would say that is healthcare, right? Uh, yeah. That is science. <laughs> yeah. um, addiction, gambling, those, those are definitely things that you're going to be dealing with as a physician. Yeah. 
RM. Are med schools still rejecting the applicants who are overweight and or obese? Um, were they ever? I don't know. This is one of those things where, and, and I don't know how serious of a question this is. Um, I, I, we probably will never have data on this because human biases yeah. are human biases. And it's very easy to reject someone and say, oh, I don't like their MCAT score when it's actually their their own subjective bias that they saw a secondary app that includes pictures, which I don't know why they do. I, I, I think your, um, your inviting bias when a secondary asks for pictures, but again, that's a whole separate topic. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think for this one? Truthfully, I didn't. Maybe it's my maybe it's my own just being naive. I didn't think this was a thing, but I do understand bias, and and I also wonder why um, why they request pictures because I, I agree with you. It's just it invites bias. What's the point? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. they undergo implicit bias training, Perinia, oh, and therefore nobody yes. is biased You're right. anymore. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So um, yeah. You know, I mean, I'd be interested to hear Courtney or Scott. I mean, obviously, you're not going to out any of your colleagues, but if you've ever noticed that kind of bias, or you know, I mean, there are other personal biases that occur. I will say, as someone who is. Um, I mean, you guys see me on camera, not my whole body, but I'm obviously very overweight. I teach yoga that is mostly aimed at fat people. So I'm very open about it. I don't think the word fat is negative. It's just, just a descriptor like short or tall. Um, so I am a fat person, but I've also experienced a lot of fat bias in my healthcare where, you know, I was there about specific problems that always came back around to, to weight. You know, I mean, even sometimes with like specialists, you know, where it's like, you know, it, like, I understand that all body factors impact other body factors, but I personally have seen a lot of overweight bias among physicians. So it, it does make me wonder if it's happening with physicians, then it means it's probably happening with med students. Is it also happening sometimes with people who are in med school committees? I mean, in the same way, and again, I don't know, I'm just conjecturing. I'm thinking of it from the student's point of view. A lot of times our non-trads say, are they going to be biased with me because I'm old well, maybe it's because they're worried you can't handle 73-hour residency weeks. Now, I would argue you shouldn't have a 73-hour residency week, but you know, I, I think it's an interesting question that you're right. We may not have data points on, but I suspect there's still some of it out there. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, bi bias is bias. What do you think, Courtney? I can jump in on this. Um, so this I would say look at the minimal technical standards is what it's called, at least for DO schools. That's a standard set of stand a standard set of standards um, <laughs> that are out there just for what you will need to perform and, and the capabilities you'll need to have as you're being trained. And as long as you fit within those bounds or you can request um, reasonable accommodations. This should not be a thing. Um, I've seen all body types um, in training and med school and things like that. So I know um, personally that I've never heard this kind of identified or singled out. I do know, you know, Rachel, you brought up age and things like that. That's always something that we're really cognizant of is making sure because it is illegal to discriminate based on, on certain things. And so um, this seems like it would probably be something that's protected as long as you were able to perform within the bounds of those minimal technical standards. And those are published and available online. So if anybody wants to reference those to make sure that, that you can perform everything that's laid out in there, you're welcome to do that. But um, I've never seen this identified um, in such a way, and you would hope that that's not a factor, but I would I would lean towards referencing that just because that's what's adopted for um, at least yeah. the ACOM side. Yeah, I like that. I, I do a, uh, a mock MMI scenario where I, I present to the student, hey, data shows that patients who have physicians or providers who are overweight or obese uh, tend to not listen to those providers, right? They're, the patient's own bias comes into play. Uh, and I, I present that to students and I say, based on this as evidence of, of potential poor patient care, 
should medical schools not accept overweight patients? And they're like, wait a minute. Like, uh, and, and 99% of people are like, no, like that shouldn't be a thing. And there are lots of reasons why things are going on. And, and some patients may, um, may uh, better connect with a physician who knows that the physician is also struggling uh, with weight and, and other things. So it's a, a very interesting scenario. But uh, again, I, I always come down to uh, whether students ask about, should I include my history of mental illness? Should I include my blah, blah, blah on, on, on my application? And the answer always is you need to be yourself. And there's always going to be, there are always going to be uh, human beings on the other end of these applications who are going to bring in their own bias, who are going to bring in their own life situations that are happening at that moment, they're reading your application, right? So you just, you never know. Uh, and so you shouldn't worry about it uh, and and just be authentic, be yourself. And, and hopefully there's going to be a medical squad there. Uh, hopefully lots of schools that will accept you and will love you. Okay. Caitlin, I graduated in 2017, but some of my prereqs were taken in 2010 to 2011. Would you recommend retaking these courses or taking new upper division science courses before applying in 2023? This comes up a lot, Scott, with uh, do prereqs expire <laughs> um, is, is typically the question. Um, to potentially, let's let's say Caitlin here is a great student, 4.0 student, um, but those prereqs were older. Some schools want to see some recency. Maybe they have some expirations on on prereqs. What what do you recommend Caitlin do here in this situation, knowing she's applying in about 10 months? Nope, oh, you're muted there, Scott. Sorry. Uh, I think it is uh, there are two issues here that I would address. Uh, one is the, you know, uh, the, the prereqs themselves and do they expire? There are some medical schools, maybe uh, only a few, uh, that they do want to see prereqs within a certain uh, time period. Um, like I said, it's kind of a small number of medical schools, but this would uh, emphasize the, the need for you, Caitlin, to know the schools that you're going to apply to and what, what they want. Uh, what they're looking for. And, and if, if you're really interested in applying to a particular school and it says, you know, we want to see prereqs within 10 years or five years or whatever, uh, then that would be a factor that you would need to consider. Now, the, the, the greater issue here, I think, is uh, you haven't been in school for five years. Uh, if you graduated in, seven, in, in 17, and, and I'm assuming perhaps um, may be true or not, that you haven't taken any classes since then. There are schools that are concerned if you've been out of, of the school routine for that long, uh, how, you know, how is that going to work? Uh, and are you going to be prepared to sort of re-enter into an academic environment uh, and, and do well? Uh, in that case, I would say uh, taking some upper division courses would be a, a good idea uh, to, uh, to get you back in the routine and to show the medical schools that you still got it. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think there would be a downside to that uh, by taking, uh, uh, you know, over the course of the next year, a, a few courses to, uh, to get back in the, in the, in the swing of things. Yeah. Isabella, I have a couple of interviews coming up in August for TMDSAS schools. Woohoo! What is your advice to help me? Did I get that woohoo right? Yeah. <laughs> what is yeah. What is your advice? Uh, it, it should be yeehaw for Texas. Come on, <laughs> complete missed opportunity there. Speaking of bias, <laughs> it's not bias. That's called stereotyping. That's not bias. <laughs> what is? <laughs> <laughs> what is your advice to help me strike a balance between being prepared but not sounding rehearsed? Well, Isabella, we have a workshop coming up uh, next first. week on Monday. Uh, is it August 1st? Mm -hmm. August 1st yeah. um, TBD on, on website to go to. I don't think we have a, a list set up yet. We just I, planned I it this say, morning. I'll make a landing page <laughs> if you give me five minutes. Yep. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that that is the the question, right? How do you how do you not sound rehearsed, Vrinia? You are the the master mock interviewer with students. Um, what is your suggestion for students 
to to do this to to sound yeah. conversational yeah be prepared but not sound robotic and rehearsed sure scott said it recently you are the expert on you so if you know yourself and you know your application there's no reason to be scripted the whole idea is to go in there and be authentic and be genuine in in showing who you are and not trying to immediately trying to impress them um they have your application you're already being you know you're, you're being called in for an interview that means that they're interested in you now you go in there and show them who you are that's it you're the expert highlight your um your personality um they want to see who you are who how you would be with patients right so you want to be normal <laughs> right you just want to come in there and just be yourself and tell them um who you are all the wonderful things that you've done uh, and let the rest kind of speak for itself yeah. Bullet points, bullet points, bullet mm -hmm. points. Let your brain fill in the rest as you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Karen, are there... I'm sorry for... <laughs> this is a terrible name these days. Such connotations. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, Karen. Nice, Karen. Are there any red flag topics you would recommend avoiding in personal challenge essays, i.e. romantic relationships, chronic illness, etc.? Courtney, what do you think about this? Again, we we want students to be authentic, but are are there potential topics where it's like, oh, why are you telling me this information? Yeah, I would say so. Again, you know, we we only get a finite amount of information that we can share. If if there's something that's kind of integral to self that you want to share, and you want to make sure that any school that you go to is you know, understanding of that, accommodating of that, or, you know, then, then feel free to add it. Um, but is this the best opportunity to offer up that information? Um, you know, it's, I would be thoughtful in these types of circumstances. There's only so many places where you can fill in the information and, and tell us kind of who you are or, or what you want to about yourself. Um, because, you know, potentially we're going to be teaching you for the next four years. You're going to go through residency. You're going to have um, that school's name on your plaque as you're, you know, a practicing physician. We want you to be proud of the school that you go to and we want you to fit in. Um, but I would just be thoughtful in the tone and the message that you're sharing and, and make sure that um, it's the best place for it. Uh, I wouldn't say there's necessarily red flag type things as much as it's how it's presented, how it's worded, um, and how that space is utilized um, in kind of making sure that that somebody's got good judgment and is thoughtful about what they've offered um, and how they worded it. These are a lot of like, it could go either way. Honestly, depending, there is a little bit of subjectivity um, to to these types of portions. Um, yeah, it, it comes back again to be authentic, right? Mm -hmm. Answer the question the best way possible, mm -hmm. and understand that maybe three out of the ten people reading your application may not like what you wrote about, and and that's okay. We can't we can't uh, uh, appease everyone in this process. Napoleon, if I take a gap year, do my stats have to be elevated compared to the average applicant? Also, how many months before applications should I ask for a rec letter? If I take a gap year, do my stats have to be elevated? I'm not sure what that question is asking. Uh, I think uh, the most recent data I saw is 40% of students are taking gap years. Um, not, not the majority, but most people are taking gap years. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't, I, your stats have nothing to do with whether or not you take a gap year. Now, if you're doing a post back during a gap year, um, then, then yeah, you're doing that because you need uh, to improve your grade. So I'm not sure how to answer that first question. Any, any of you reading that differently? Yeah. I mean, I just read it as, you know, he wants he wants to know if if uh, that is uh, if taking a gap year changes the dynamic mm -hmm. or changes the the way that a medical school looks at your application. And the answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to evaluate your application 
based on w what it is and what it looks like and what you've done. And, and if you took a gap year, they're going to be looking at what you did during that gap year and why you did a gap year. And, and you know, uh, it, it, it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with stats. And so mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I don't think that that uh, should uh, cause you to feel like you need to, you know, be concerned about your, uh, about anything related to your, your stats. Mm -hmm. Avocado. <laughs> what, what do you think are the <laughs> chances of coming off a wait list in August? Slim to none, right. unfortunately. Right. Schools, schools are starting, right? There's always a chance. There's always, there's always a chance, but yeah. Very limited. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nina, I work at a clinic. I, had med lab tech phlebotomy and shadowing experience in the same facility doesn't matter if most of my letters of recommendation come from that one place hmm. no as long as those people know you mm -hmm. easy easy answers yes no <laughs> uh and and let me expand on that just a, a tiny bit right is and you need to make sure that you're you're submitting the letters that are required by each school mm -hmm. unfortunately that's one of the pains in the butt of this uh application process is every school has what they require for letters of rec so make sure you meet those minimums mm -hmm. <laughs> joe does the medical school you attend immediately affect the location of residencies you can be accepted to Let's go to Courtney on this one because there is, again, this predominant myth um, that I, I think potentially is based in some some old fact that going to a DO school, you can't get into competitive specialties and you're, you're, you can only go to family practice or whatever. Um, what, do, what do you think about this question? The answer is no. Um, it's, it's going to be on you as a student, but all MDs and DOs go into the same software, basically the same platform to apply to residency programs and things like that. You know, there are some residencies that are attached to a university system. I don't know if they would give any type of preference to students coming out of that program, but beyond that, there's not. And I know that, you know, because at my school specifically, we took over 90% of our students from out of state outside of New Mexico. And so they were coming from everywhere, but they also matched everywhere and they matched the specialties and, and everything on down the list. And so um, I haven't seen evidence of that. And it's not just speaking for my one institution, just across the board. Um, you're all going into the, the same platform and in the same timeline looking for those residencies. So no, and, and a lot of it will just be on you as an applicant, much like it is applying to medical school yep. um, in making sure that you have a really strong application and that you've done your due diligence on your side uh, to be a strong applicant for these residency uh, programs. So yeah, uh, the answer is no. Yeah. yeah, big picture. The answer is no. And I keep coming back to right. They're going to be individual programs with individual biases. Um, I, I always talk about the old crusty white guys that need to to move on in their life and <laughs> and stop running programs um, with my uh, now on pause specialty stories podcast. I've had the privilege of talking to lots of residency directors and I I always ask them, what do DO students need to do to potentially overcome any negative bias that is out there for this specific specialty. The far majority, and whether or not they're lying because they're they're public on a podcast, uh, the far majority say there is no bias. We look at every applicant the same. We don't separate MD versus DO. <clears throat> I had one that will always stick out to me uh, at Northwestern. The, the podcast is, is is live so it's not like i'm calling them out specifically but it was a northwestern program director i forget specifically uh what program it was what what specialty it was but but he said we we don't look at do students we just we don't need to we have plenty of md applicants and so he he did put do students do applicants at a lower tier but again that's that's one program director that's one program that's not specialty wide that's not universal universally accepted so 
individual biases always come into play because we are humans and, and this is just life. Yeah, and, and you can look at published information on mm -hmm. where people are matching and who they've accepted and things like that. I think the one that I would always point to is maybe plastic surgery. That one is predominantly still MD. Yep. But other than that, I've seen plenty of DOs match into all of the other specialties in, in mass. And so you can look at match rates, match numbers, a program, and what they're taking. And so if you're forward thinking and you kind of know what you want to go into, you can absolutely start researching that now. But, um, you know, maybe maybe years ago that was a thing. But even on the back end, we have information on the ERA system where it will show preferred USMLE, preferred complex and USMLE, um, what they've taken in the past. We have a bunch of information so we can kind of guide our students through that. Every school has access to that information. So yeah, kind of hard as a pre-med, you don't know what you don't know, but trust your school. You know, you can go anywhere and be successful as long as you're a solid student and you're, you know, you're doing what you need to hustle. Um, yeah. But Rose Andre, uh, I am in my first year of undergrad. Ooh, sounds like a perfect person to give a subscription to Mapped App Pro, uh, and have done enough clinical and volunteer hours. Oh, it's a Whoa. trap! It's a trap. <laughs> That's Star Wars. It's a trap. It's a trap. Uh, <laughs> Admiral Akbar. Yeah, whatever his name is. <laughs> did, did I do that right? It's a trap. Hey, he's kind of got some big eyes and a big neck, sure. <laughs> but he's got the little fingerlings hanging off. Anyway, uh, for my second year, I want to focus on research. Is it too early? What should I focus on in my second year? Rachel, you wanna you wanna tackle this one? Yeah, sorry, I'm still laughing about Admiral Akbar. Um, <laughs> okay. Well. Oh, Veronica and I are having a fight over the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> She's helping. <laughs> I should stop touching it. Okay, so uh, Rose, here's why we're joking about it being a trap. Um, the idea that you've done enough clinical and volunteer is sort of a false assumption. Because first of all, I've never heard any dean or director of admission agree on what enough is, right? Um, that's a relative number. It varies. There's no magic number that says enough. The other is uh, with clinical experience in particular, even more than, than volunteering, depending on how you're defining volunteering, um, you're going to be doing clinical the rest of your life if you're a physician. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do it in the first year of undergrad and then not do it again for the next three or four years, that sends an optic to me that you don't really like clinical. And that worries me and makes me wonder about whether or not you're really interested in med school for the right reasons. Um, clinical should be something you do consistently throughout your pre-med process. It is first and foremost, even before for the med schools, for you. Clinical is for you because it helps you confirm your desire that you want to be a physician. And if it's really confirming your desire, then ideally you love it and you don't ever want to stop. So I'm not saying you have to do 20 hours a week every week forever, but, you know, can you get a volunteer clinical role where you do five or 10 hours a month? Um, you know, it, it makes me it makes me nervous to hear that you want to just do checkbox mentality, get it done. Um, and then the second issue is here is you want to focus on research. Fine, focus on research if you like it, but research tends to be an overrated activity for, for undergrads. Um, research will matter a lot in med school as you're applying to residency, but it typically is not a huge factor in applying to med school. So again, I'm not saying you have to do it or you're not allowed to do it, but you should be doing research if it's interesting to you. So I'm not sure what you mean by too early. Um, so there's just a lot of assumptions baked in here. And what I want to help you reset and think is there are a few activities that are required for all pre-meds, and those are really clinical and shadowing. And then beyond that, you should be doing whatever interests you. Um, obviously, making space to continue to do great with grades and school and leaving time for MCAT next year. But um, yeah, the, just the wording of enough clinical hours makes me makes me nervous for you. I want to see you doing it consistently for the next few years. Consistency, consistency. Yes. It's like pancake batter. It's just got to be the right consistency. <laughs> 
<laughs> I actually gave a talk at a podcast conference once and, and gave that analogy. <laughs> um, got another one? Crickets. Christian. I went to Honduras on a medical mission and was able to scrub into cases and retract. Should I leave that portion out of my personal statement and just refer to it as shadowing? Ha ha. The it's a trap again. <laughs> so that the double AMC has a pretty firm stance on medical mission trips and uh, doing things that you would not be allowed to do here in the States as a, a pre-med, as an untrained um, applicant. Now, is retracting something potentially that you you may be able to do here as a pre-med, not trained in anything? Probably not. Uh, most most pre-meds, if they're in the operating room, are standing in a corner, um, barely able to see anything. Um, Scott, what do you think about Christian here? Leave, leave it off. Uh, avoid talking about this and, and just kind of in general what, what they saw. Absolutely. Uh, you do not want to mention any type of thing that you would not be able to do in the U.S. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I think that that has a red flag written all over it. So I would leave that out and just refer to it as clinical experience uh, and uh, that you were able to watch, you know, surgeries or, or whatever, but leave out any hands on things. Yep. We agree. Well, it's 2.03, so I think we're, hey, look we're at that. coming to the end here. We're I do so want to, before maybe, we... Uh, maybe that's why Veronica didn't throw up another question. She's like, <laughs> time, guys. We were having so much fun. So we had earlier talked about what's the best way to do interview prep. I've got that website up. So if you go to mapped.com slash workshop, that's going to take you to our interview workshop sign-up page. Um yeah going to be the five biggest mistakes students make in med school interviews. So we'll walk you through those common mistakes to avoid. And then we will jump right into practice. So you brave souls from the audience will be volunteering to do practice questions with some of us. Um, we will be kind, but we will also be constructive. So it's always uh, really exciting to see who's brave enough to go live in front of their peers. And usually everybody does great and you'll learn a lot. So please come join us Monday. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. And for that student who was a freshman going into second year, email info at map.com. We'll get you a free subscription to Mapped App Pro. Everyone else can get a free trial uh, for 30 days using the referral code 30 days free over at mapped.com. That's M A P P D.com. Go calculate your GPA, go track all of your activities, uh, and go ask for some help from one of us in, uh, in map tap. So, uh, everyone have a wonderful day. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye, and thanks for being Courtney. You, you made it. Woohoo. Yeehaw. Yeehaw. Yeah. <laughs>